thank you very much for being here today, Luigi. Thank you very much for the invitation. And with all the negatives of uh, digital platforms, one of the positive is that we can uh, connect throughout the world uh, during a pandemic and, uh, and discuss our work. So I'm very uh, happy of that. And this is joint work with uh, Krishna Kampali, who is a, a student at Columbia, and of course, you know, Raghu Rajan. So the motivation is, is very simple. Uh, venture capitalist seems to be reluctant to fund investments in spaces that are close to large digital platforms. And uh, uh, one of them say, this is a real thing, the, sc the scale of these companies and their impact and what can be funded uh, is massive. And uh, this is uh, at the first moment seems like strange because the prospect of being acquired should uh, spur not stifle innovation and investment. And uh, so before we uh, go into trying to understand whether this statement is right or wrong, let's first uh, look at the data and see what happens in this space. Uh, so if you look at uh, uh, VC early investments in the social media space, you see that the dollar amount has plummeted. Now, this might not be that surprising because there are waves in VCs and, uh, and there was a moment in which this was the hot moment and uh, later on is not anymore. So we would like to do a more systematic, possibly event study of what happens in terms of investments around the time uh, that you have this acquisition. So how do we go empirically? Uh, we identify the major acquisitions made by Google and Facebook, so acquisition above 500 million in uh, the period 2006-2016. Uh, and then, so these are the acquisitions of the events in a sense. And then we look at the treated firms as firms that are similar to the one acquired uh, in the same uh, uh, rough uh, uh, space. And, uh, and then we define uh, a cycle adjusted measure of investment as uh, a measure of how much VCs put into them versus what uh, they put to them in uh, uh, the software industry in general. And we compute this uh, cycle adjusted measure around uh, acquisitions event. And then uh, very much in the finance style of event studies, we aggregate this across events to try to, uh, to give a sense of, of what happens. And just uh, in case you want to, to know this, uh, these are the acquisitions. And uh, as you know, Facebook, the two major acquisitions are uh, WhatsApp uh, and Instagram. Uh, for Google, they go from YouTube uh, to Waze and so on and so forth. And uh, what you see, is uh, um, in uh, before the period, uh, you have a fairly constant level of uh, investments. And then uh, shortly after the acquisition, this is the blue line, you see that uh, this level is going down. And now you say, okay, maybe this is not a phenomenon unique of, the, of Facebook and Google. Maybe this happens throughout the entire software industry. So what we, done, what we have done, and this is the, the red line, uh, what we've done is we look at uh, other acquisitions done by other firms, same magnitude, same period, do the same analysis. And uh, what we get is uh, the red line uh, where you have a much bigger uh, pre-trend. Uh, so it's a bit on the eye of the beholder whether uh, the level after is uh, above and below, depends on, on what year you take as a reference. But clearly what you see, and, and in the paper we do that more systematically than just a graph, but uh, what you see clearly is that uh, uh, there seem to be a unique phenomenon that in the space surrounding digital platforms, uh, in, um, you see a decline, a relative decline in investments after the acquisition take place. And so um, why uh, that's the case and what is difference about uh, uh, this world and the world of uh, micro 101 that we all know so well, where this effect will not happen. Uh, so first of all, we know for a fact that uh, this is a sector where there are few gigantic incumbents. Uh, this is a sector where there are very strong uh, network externalities <clears throat> and a sector where there are some uh, switching costs. Um, and where uh, platforms are two-sided or multi-sided, uh, and uh, one side is charged 
is your price. That's clearly the case for Facebook uh, and, and Google. And so the question is whether uh, the intuition that we have from uh, Michael 101 uh, might not be there once we uh, put this picture, this, this element together. And so before I try to present uh, quickly the model, let me give you uh, the, the intuition. And intuition is extremely simple. So uh, in any acquisition, uh, the price of the entrance depends on two facts, depends on the competition among readers and depends on the entrance outside option to go it alone. Now, one of the characteristic I just described above is that in this space, uh, incumbents are very powerful and tend to be uh, monopolistic in the sector. So competition among bidders is not really what drives the evaluation, uh, which suggests that uh, the outside option to go it alone becomes quite important. Now, what this uh, go it alone value depends very much, of course, on the quality of the entrant, but also on the number of customers that the new entrant can attract. Uh, and this is simply because of the network effect. And so now the customer decision to uh, 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 switch or not depends itself on some uh, uh, other parties. And uh, now in the paper circulated, we call them techies. The paper is under revision. So uh, we updated that I would call app designers. So the, this decision is, is swayed very much by the app designers. Uh, which have, of course, some cost of switching. So if I need to prepare my software, not only for one platform, but for another, I need to adapt my software. And, uh, and so uh, entrant is already a disadvantage because uh, many of the app designers are with incumbent. And ironically, uh, this disadvantage can be uh, exacerbated if you see an acquisition down the line, because if you see an acquisition up down the line, in uh, you're not, as an app, you're not willing to pay the cost of switching when you know that everything will be integrated pretty soon. And so the result is that high expectation of being acquired, depress the number of app designers that switch, uh, and in so doing, they depress the attractiveness of the new platform for ordinary customers. Um, and this is the press, the, 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 the number for two reasons. One is there is an inference about expectations. You see uh, very few app designers, you think that the platform is less valuable because you think app designers more, know more than you do. Uh, but also because of the network scenario, you use a platform because of the, the app that are there. So the fewer app uh, available, the less attractive is the platform. So that depressed the number of ordinary customers who choose the new uh, platform. Uh, the pressing is standalone value. Uh, and uh, for the reason I explained before, this depression is standalone value. The press also uh, the acquisition prices. And, uh, and then once you understand that the press the acquisition prices is a very easy step to say, uh, this depresses the investment by potential entrance because uh, if I cannot get out at an attractive valuation, I am not investing. And that closes the circle. Uh, now, can I intervene if you please, let me? Please, because absolutely. there was a question about, uh, say, you compare the situation of without network effects, or, or uh, you showed this graph with the blue and uh, red lines. Yeah. And there was a question from Yossi Spiegel asking why the red one was also going up after the acquisition. So, what's the economic rationale for that? Uh, to start with, because you then move to the network effects and explain the intuition for that. But I think the question is, why do we see the red uh, going up after year zero? Um, so I'm not so sure that uh, you can make uh, a big statement about uh, one year. And it says, uh, if you uh, look on average, the three years before and the three years after, you see a slight decline in investment. So I'm not trying to make uh, a strong statement that uh, in the software industry in general, uh, the investment go up after an acquisition. Uh, what uh, we can do, and we do it in the paper systematically with the right statistics, is uh, that there is a difference between acquisitions conducted by Facebook and Google and other acquisitions in the software industry where uh, we don't expect those uh, network scenarios and the platform features to be so 
uh, prevalent as they are in the Facebook and Google. So you should interpret the, the thing you should focus on is the difference between the blue and the red line, not necessarily the uh, behavior of any single year uh, in either line, in particular of the red line. Okay, then there's a follow-up question. I don't want to take so much time on that, but just to clarify. So then Yossi asks about the blue line does not change much either. So that the same can be said about the blue line. I think that his question is about the difference between red and blue looks similar before and after. Um, yeah, this is why I uh, refer to the paper where we do the difference statistically and they are statistically different. So that's the okay. only thing I can tell you. Okay, okay, thank you. I think this is the only question for me. Okay, uh, so that, but that, thank you for the questions and please interrupt me. That was a good moment because now I, uh, after giving the intuition, let me give, describe briefly uh, how do we go about modeling and then uh, the, the specific of, uh, of the model itself. So, um, uh, as we know, networks analysis lead to, to multiple equilibria. So, um, if uh, I think that many customers will switch, I will tend to switch too, and, and vice versa if I don't. And uh, we know this situation can lead to uh, sort of a sunspots equilibria, uh, very similar to bank runs. And so that's the reason why we're gonna go in the direction of uh, uh, global games in order to, to get a unique equilibrium, which is related to fundamentals. Uh, and that allows us to do some comparative studies. So let me go to, to the model, which is, is very simple. Sorry. So they, yeah. Sorry for interrupting. Just before you get dive into model, there was another question. I saw it a little bit later. Uh, what exactly are the app designers in the intuition that uh, you provided? So what are those app designers? That's a question from Andre Haju. Sure. Uh, I think that uh, uh, we provide in the paper multiple explanations. One is, is literally the explanation of uh, app de designers. So uh, people that uh, provide some... Uh, additional software that makes the use of the platform uh, more uh, uh, valuable. So uh, for example, uh, there is an issue whether uh, if you use uh, Google map or Waze before, uh, you can uh, uh, crowdsource uh, the information about uh, where the police cars are. And so there, there was an app uh, on Waze that was uh, providing that information. And uh, when, uh, when uh, Waze was acquired by Google, there was an issue whether Google will integrate uh, that particular application uh, uh, or not allowed and uh, whether they will develop or not and so on and so forth. Now, in this particular case, there is some liability issue because of course you're trying to scam the police. Uh, so that's an extra la layer of problem, but that's, uh, that's one interpretation. The second interpretation is uh, some kind of uh, influencer that, uh, are more informed than everybody else uh, because uh, uh, they might be sort of a, a technician of the sector or they might uh, have some positive utility out of uh, uh, searching and finding uh, new applications. I am always the last one to switch to anything because I don't, I'm not a, a techie and I, I don't wanna pay that cost, but uh, uh, my son or other people I know are really sort of active and they find it, they're proud to be uh, the first one to use an application. And in doing so, they provide uh, uh, information and uh, reassurance to a larger public. And they're proud to be the front runner. They're proud to be uh, the influencer. So you can take either interpretation uh, uh, and the model I think goes through in, in both interpretation. Okay. Thank oh. you. Okay, so um, so there is an incumbent platform I, which is threatened by a new entrant E, and without loss of generality, we assume that the quality of the incumbent is normalized to zero, and the quality of the uh, new entrant, the, the incremental quality is theta. Uh, and as I described, there are two groups of uh, uh, customers, the app designers, which uh, we assume have a measure of lambda, and ordinary customer uh, with a measure of one. Now, uh, the app designers, um, at date uh, zero, they observe a public signal about uh, the quality and uh, their posterior uh, belief of quality after they observe is distributed normally with a mean of Q and a precision, I'm sorry, that is the other way around, is alpha. And uh, if the app designers uh, will adapt the app to uh, uh, the new platform, 
they get a per period incremental utility, uh, which is uh, somewhat equal to uh, the incremental technical quality of the platform. Uh, the idea, if you stick uh, very closely to the interpretation of app designers, what you can think about is uh, uh, you're gonna recover the cost of investment only if enough people eventually will use the platform and people eventually will use the platform only the quality is, is good enough. So uh, this is uh, uh, directly a function of quality. We take uh, a very simple linear function, but uh, don't interpret that uh, so uh, narrowly. And then uh, uh, app designer will have to pay a cost to adapt. And, uh, and once they, um, they adapt, they can easily uh, multi-home. And uh, this uh, cost of adaptation is uniformly distributed between zero and, and level um, uh, S upper bar and is uh, individually specific. So important, uh, the signal of service is public, uh, but their cost of switching is, is private. And then there are the ordinary customers. The ordinary customer don't have sufficient information to switch right away. Uh, they wait to see what uh, the app designers do. And uh, what do they observe? They observe two things. They observe how many app designers switch and they observe a private signal about the incremental uh, quality of the entrant. And this private signal is equal to the true value plus a random noise where again, the precision here is better. Is, is better. And uh, uh, the difference is while uh, the app designers don't have uh, uh, network externality, the ordinary customer do have some network externality. So their switching decision is based not only on the expected technical characteristic of the new platform, but also the number of customers a platform will be able to attract or retain. And uh, so uh, I think that this is a uh, repeat, sorry. Uh, and then at date one, uh, you have uh, the, the two companies decide whether to merge or not. Uh, now, uh, the share that uh, each one gets is determined by a bargaining process that I will describe later. Uh, if they do merge, the superior technology will be adapted by the merge entity and all the customer will enjoy it regardless of whether they switch or not. And so the acquirer and the merger ensure a smooth transition to all customers without any problem. If the two companies don't merge, they will survive for a number of years independently with a different technology. Now, what is the value of the new entrant? Uh, the platform service is given for free to customers uh, in the spirit of Google and Facebook in exchange for their data. So uh, where do the platform get their profit? There are other profits uh, from uh, the advertising side of the market. And uh, what, what is their value there? Their value is a function of the number of customers the platform can obtain. And, uh, and for two very simple reasons, one is that more customers on the platform means more eyeballs for the advertising. And also, of course, more customers also means better data, so better targeting ad and so on and so forth. So you can think about the value of the entrant platform as uh, uh, V uh, of P, where P is the fraction of ordinary customers that switch to it. And of course, this is an increasing function of P. So, uh, this is the timing of the game. Uh, the app designers see the public signal and decide whether to uh, switch or not based on the adaptation cost. Then at time half, the ordinary customers see if the app designers uh, uh, have adapted, uh, observe their private signal and decide whether to switch or not. Then at date one, the incumbents and the entrant decide whether to merge and uh, the terms of the mergers. And then basically, uh, if they don't merge us, uh, life will continue as it is uh, for the future. And then we'll discuss what happens there. Sorry, so, I have a question. Sorry, please, uh, please, please. I have a question on the timing. I believe some other people also have. Could you go back to the timing? Uh, just so Absolutely, yeah. It, please. So uh, basically, uh, given that the app designers see a public signal, so yeah. the fact that as an ordinary customer, I observe an app designer adapting doesn't give me any information about the quality itself. Is this correct? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the answer is yes or no. So we, we observe that uh, all the, um, the app designers observe the same signal 
which is not observed by the customer. So okay. there is some value provided by that. Uh, I but see. as I will explain, uh, if I have time in the robustness, this is not crucial. The crucial component of the app designers is that they provide some network externality to the ordinary customer. So that's, that's the key ingredient of the model. Okay, so basically you are going to argue that uh, it's not their information, private information, which is more valued, but it's more that the, they generate network effects early in the game. Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. okay. So there are, I think, uh, other questions probably on the, the model. So Chiara Fumagalli asks, why app designers pay a cost to adapt to a new platform while adapting to the merge platform, which embodies the innovative features of the new platform is costless? Um, so I think it's, uh, it's very simple. Uh, going back to an old platform that uh, we all understand and know very well, think about uh, uh, um, the earlier, I mean, maybe this is uh, too old for many of the participants, uh, but uh, uh, when uh, 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 Microsoft was coming up with Windows, there was an issue of whether uh, some uh, products that were developed, uh, for example, for the Mac base, uh, should be also ported on Windows or not and what cost this would bring. And so if I am the producer of Excel and initially I had produced only for the Windows, uh, only for the Mac environment, uh, actually what happened with, with Excel, they first produced for, uh, for the Mac, then they produced for, uh, for DOS. And then there was an issue whether they will uh, uh, produce for um, the windows, the new windows, or they produce for OS2. Uh, most people probably don't remember what OS2 was, but is, is a different uh, uh, operating system that at the time was a potential competitor of, uh, of Windows. So I think that, uh, uh, so they, they definitely have a cost of portability. Once uh, uh, the, let's say Microsoft buys OS2, they make everything backward compatible. And so there is no, no need to, to pay that cost anymore. So that's uh, kind of what, uh, what this is all about. That's the intuition for the cost. And, and, and by the way, sorry. And by the way, we, we eliminate, because we wanted to have them all the simple, we eliminate a cost of the ordinary customer as well. I think that if we assume a cost C for customer to switch, uh, everything goes through with a, with a C, an additional C in the equation that I will describe in a second. And there was also another question from Giancarlo Spagnolo. He asked, uh, I believe it is Spagnolo, yeah. So he asked uh, whether uh, the, 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 is it important that the app designers do not care about network effects? I mean, uh, would the results uh, no, also go no, through? No, it's not important. It makes uh, solving the model simpler. Uh, yeah. So, but I, I don't think it's crucial. Okay, thank you. I think that's all. Okay, so um, again, perfect timing because now we're going to the more the, the incentives uh, in the game once I describe the game. So uh, the app designers know that if they switch, they expect a game of Q, that's the expectation of theta, for a period that is uh, only one if the merger takes place and is equal to N if the merger does not take place. So as a result, each app designers will decide to switch uh, very obviously when the benefits are bigger than the cost. So the benefits are one plus M times Q. The cost is the individual cost SI. So that's the decision to switch. So uh, remember that SI is uniformly distributed. So the measure of app designers who switch at day zero is given by uh, that expression there. If you are in the interior and of course, uh, can be a, a, a different if you are the boundaries, we proceed in interior for simplicity, but not, nothing changes if you analyze the boundaries, it's simply a, a more complicated analysis. So think about uh, given uh, a public signal uh, Q, you have a mass uh, of app designer switch that is given by uh, that particular expression. Now they are the ordinary customers. Uh, they observe how many app designers invest in the platform and uh, now uh, they know, uh, or they have an expectation about M, uh, so they can uh, back out uh, Q. Uh, so that's why uh, observing or not observing theta doesn't really make a difference because there is no noise there. They can uh, observe uh, uh, Q perfectly. And, uh, um, and so they have a 
initial expectation of theta and they combine this initial prior of theta with a, a private signal that they observe at the period uh, two. And, uh, and then, um, and this, uh, uh, they're gonna have a posterior belief uh, where the average of this posterior belief is got, uh, given by raw, uh, which is uh, of course a weighted average of the two signal they receive and the precision is given by uh, the sum of the precision of the two signals. So an ordinary customer will switch if and only if the network externality adjusted quality of the entrant is superior. So uh, this is the equation. Let me try to explain in steps what this is. So first of all, uh, raw i is their expectation of theta. Uh, then they have their uh, measure of the externality provided by ordinary customer. That's nothing else but P of uh, raw. So is the fraction of uh, ordinary customer they switch uh, as a function of their expectation of raw. Uh, and then there is the, the number of app design in the switch, and uh, that's the one plus m lambda q divided by s up above. And this should be bigger than uh, the, um, uh, the fraction of ordinary customer that stay uh, in the old platform, uh, plus uh, the app design and present, present in the old platform. And here we assume uh, multi ohming by. Uh, the uh, app designer. So if you are Excel and you produce a new version for Windows, you can do both Windows and OS2 at the same time. Uh, in the paper, we analyze also the case in which you can't and basically nothing major changes in uh, just, uh, just the threshold of, uh, of uh, switching changes, okay? So that's the uh, um, uh, decision rule. And uh, this is a typical global game. Uh, so we conjecture uh, that all, uh, ordinary customer will follow a switching strategy where they switch if their prior quality exceed a certain threshold. Uh, and then when a customer is the marginal switcher, he has to believe that the fraction P of customer uh, will switch as well to be, for this to be an equilibrium. So the fraction P should... Uh, exposed be at least as high as his own posterior. And so we can calculate uh, P at the switching point uh, in the following way. At the switching point, you should have the raw star is, uh, is uh, uh, plus two, uh, one minus the cumulative of a normal function calculated at the raw star plus the other terms that are there. And so uh, we first uh, uh, identify this function S of rho. Uh, and if uh, uh, gamma, which I realize I didn't define here, but is basically a measure of the precision is uh, sufficiently is, is small. So if there's not uh, too much uncertainty, uh, then the function S is always increasing in raw. Uh, and, uh, and so there is a unique uh, switching equilibrium that uh, we can at least uh, uh, plot as a function, for example, of the period uh, that you expect uh, this stuff to continue. And, and so uh, the first uh, uh, and important result is that the optimal switching point uh, decreases and the fraction of ordinary customers switching to the entrant increases in the number of periods that the techie expects, uh, this is the app designer, expects the entrant to remain independent. So uh, the bottom line here is, is quite uh, simple, is uh, if you expect this new entrant to remain independent longer, you will have more app designers switching to the new entrant uh, per given expectation, the quality difference. Uh, this will increase the network externality to ordinary customer uh, joining the entrant. And in turn, this will reduce uh, the quality threshold at which uh, you are gonna switch. And uh, this enhances the expected value of the entrant as a standalone entity, because remember, the value of the new entrant is a function of how many customers have switched. And uh, what is important here is that uh, price is not a factor. So <clears throat> the customer cannot be attracted by uh, offering a lower price because uh, there is a, uh, a zero lower bound. And we can discuss how realistic this zero lower bound is. But uh, uh, at the moment, let's keep a, a zero lower bound. So now we have the merger game where the merger game, we assume a traditional bargaining where 
uh, uh, mu is the bargaining power of the incumbent, uh, take uh, V of one as the discounted sum of profits of the merged platform. Uh, now, we know that uh, uh, V of one is gonna be uh, bigger than the sum of the value of the entry of the incumbent if they operate separately. Uh, the, the, the profits of a monopolies are bigger than the profits of two duopolies. So uh, is always ex post efficient to merge. And uh, in, the, in, in our simple bargaining game where there is no friction, uh, you always do the efficient thing. So you always uh, end up merging. So the only question that is relevant is what is the price at which uh, you merge? And of course, this price is driven uh, by the incumbent bargaining power but is also given uh, by this term here, which is the standalone value of the new entrant. Now, notice that uh, this uh, standalone value is a function of the customer switching, and this is indexed by M, that stands for a merger will take place, because as we just uh, uh, described, uh, this uh, number of people switching is a function of whether you expect a merger or not. And so, Imagine for a second a world, and I'm not saying this is uh, the, how the world should be, but in, imagine a, a world in which for whatever reason, uh, mergers are not allowed. Uh, then uh, the payoff of the entrant will be only the standalone value because there is no game, there is no merger, nothing. Um, and this standalone value will be V of V of P and M where not, not merger. And uh, now what is important is that the P of NM is larger than the P of M for the reasons that uh, corollary one suggests, because uh, if you don't expect a merger, more app designers would switch, as a result, more, more ordinary customer would switch. And so the expectation of the value of uh, the entrant is going to be higher if you don't expect a merger than if you expect a merger, okay? And so, uh, then if that's the case, uh, what you can say, if the enter bargaining power is either zero or small enough, then the payoff of a new incumbent or a new entrant is uh, larger in a ward in which you cannot merge than in a ward if, that you can merge. And it's larger simply because uh, in very simple terms, you can pre-commit not to sell out. Now, uh, what is interesting is once you think in those terms, you start thinking about what is what are the other strategies to pre-commit not to sell out. Uh, but one is to hire an egotistic uh, uh, CEO that is full of himself. And uh, I don't want to name names, but uh, a lot come to mind uh, recently. So I think that uh, that could be an optimal strategy. The other is uh, you give an extreme amount of power to the incumbent so that if it's a little bit ego, ego, the, the, the founder, so if it's a little bit egotistic, it doesn't sell. So think about uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. He has a dual class stock in Facebook. And that's the reason why he turned down a, a very generous offer of uh, <clears throat> MySpace back then. Uh, everybody thought he was crazy. Eventually he's still laughing, uh, but in the, at the moment was clearly sort of a, uh, any venture capitalist would have sold uh, Epily if he had the ability. It was only his desire to be in charge that the block that. Uh, now, let's go back one period and now assume that the potential entrant does not get uh, the theta as a mana from Evan, but has to pay a cost. So imagine that uh, the new entrant uh, draws a, uh, a technology of quality theta and uh, before deciding whether to invest, we'll uh, compare the expected profit uh, given a cost of R&D. So uh, the, she draws the technology, knows the cost of the technology, and uh, looks at the expected valuation uh, of uh, entry. And, uh, and then, of course, you're going to enter only if the expectation is bigger than the cost you're paying. And so uh, in a world in which incumbents are prohibited from entering, uh, then, of course, uh, uh, you are going to see that uh, uh, the number of people entering will go up uh, rather than down because uh, uh, they uh, increase uh, value of the investment. So uh, long story short, 
is not uh, out of the question if we take uh, the fact that an acquisition took place and was also allowed by the antitrust authority. Remember, uh, this effect is seen over years. It's not an event study in the finance term that is a day. Uh, this is over a certain number of, uh, of uh, years. So if you see uh, that acquisitions uh, are cleared by the antitrust authority, uh, the market updates that uh, future acquisition will take place. And so uh, that the incentive to enter will be reduced because uh, customers will uh, not switch as a result of the game we just described. Uh, so long story short, I think this is uh, uh, what we think uh, uh, Wenger, who is a venture capitalist from uh, U uh, Union Ventures had in mind. Now, what is interesting is that uh, uh, this might lead to a resurrection of the very old uh, nascent industry protection argument because uh, you can say that uh, if you prohibit uh, in a certain uh, economic area acquisition by an incumbent, you're gonna see uh, development of local uh, uh, in, uh, platform. And uh, we know that in Europe, local platform uh, really did not uh, develop very much. Uh, by contrast, uh, uh, China did develop uh, uh, a, a concurrent platforms in part as a result of uh, prohibition of the existing platform to enter. And uh, the control experiment is what happens uh, now in India uh, with TikTok as a result of uh, uh, some uh, border dispute uh, with China. Uh, the, the Indian government uh, prohibit or put some restriction on the use of TikTok and immediately you saw uh, a nascent industry in, Indi uh, in, uh, in India trying to compete. Uh, so um, I think that uh, you see some elements of that. Now, um, we don't want to come out of this paper and the paper is much more uh, in detail on this and I'm happy to answer questions because I'm running out of time, but uh, is, uh, we don't want to come say it's optimal to uh, uh, prohibit all acquisitions because as you can see easily from this model, acquisitions are exposed efficient. Now, uh, the, the thing that uh, uh, clearly comes to, to mind is that uh, uh, you wanna uh, make uh, uh, switching costs as low as possible. So uh, mandating common standard and interoperability are certainly things that go in the direction of making uh, uh, the efficient decision. Um, so uh, in, uh, in, if you don't go that route, the route of prohibited mergers has a lot of problems, both in theory and in practice. In theory, because it prevents the industry from realizing exposed efficiency. In practice, because uh, if you take uh, an antitrust case-by-case uh, -case approach, it's very hard for an antitrust authority to say, you shouldn't do a merger because exposed the merger is efficient. So if you, every single merger will be approved exposed because it's efficient, but exempt uh, might be not the right thing to do. So conclusion, I think that uh, the only thing we're trying to do in this model is <clears throat> construct a simple uh, model to rationalize uh, the existence of this kill zone. Now, these are, even if there's a kill in the title, these are different from the killer acquisition that Florian and other develop. Uh, this is more an area where nobody wants to invest because uh, they don't get sufficient return. And uh, I think that uh, it depends very much on three frictions. And in the paper, we do a better job than I could do in the presentation, trying to see the, the uh, robustness of this uh, three friction. Uh, one is network externalities, switching costs, and lack of, uh, a lack of price competition. Uh, in the paper, we discuss, for example, attempts by some browser like Brave to pay people to use the browser. Um, these uh, successes have not been, these um, attempts have not been very successful. So I think there is some evidence that uh, the zero lower bound uh, applies not only in macro, but also in micro. Um, and uh, the evidence we find is, is consistent. Uh, now, it's not obvious how to address the problem. Uh, what it is important is that uh, kind of uh, digital platforms do provide uh, different intuition that the, 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 the obvious uh, uh, 21st, uh, uh, 20th century uh, economics, but uh, I'm very 
scale of saying that to people, uh, especially in Toulouse, given that uh, they are at the forefront of this analysis. And, and with this, uh, I'm done. Excellent timing. Thank you very much, Luigi, for that. So we have discussion by uh, Luis Cabral, so for five minutes, and then we will open for Q&A. Okay, thank you. Let me know when I'm um, past five minutes and I'll try to stop then. Um, so thank you for um, allowing me to discuss this uh, a super interesting paper. Um, I think the best part of this paper, in my opinion, is that it establishes the existence of a so-called kill zone. And I think it does so in a very compelling way. So just to quote from the paper, normalized VC investments in startups um, in the same space as the company acquired by Google and Facebook dropped by over 40%. That's a very large number. 40% uh, in number of deals and 20% in the three years um, uh, um, following an acquisition. So um, that's big in terms of economic effect. That's big in terms of statistical significance. And um, uh, I'm not an empirical economist, but from what I could read and understand in the paper, uh, the data seems pretty clear in that point. And I think this is a strong empirical point. Um, you know, in what follows, I'm going to be uh, somewhat critical about other aspects of the paper. So I think it's important to understand that, um, to me at least, if, if, if there were nothing else in the paper, and there is a lot in the paper, but if there was uh, nothing else in the paper, this would uh, justify its existence because uh, the kill zone has been in the law, and sort of industry law for a long time, but to the best of my knowledge, there has been no convincing and systematic evidence of its size and prevalence. So I think the paper uh, does that and does that well. Um, so the part of the paper that I'm uh, uh, less excited about is, is, is the model. Uh, um, I believe the behavioral premise that uh, tech is unlikely to adopt a new platform because they anticipate it will be acquired. Um, I personally don't find that as compelling as the empirical evidence. I don't have any data to support my, uh, my skepticism, by the way, let me be very clear. Uh, but my guess is that it's not a, a very good description of the main forces at stake. Uh, do I believe that techies are very proud to be the first to adopt, like uh, uh, Luigi's uh, 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 kid? Uh, yes, of course, definitely. Do I believe that those uh, early adopters are afraid that the platform will be acquired and therefore that their efforts will be meaningless? I'm very skeptical about that. Um, had I predicted the future, would I have been less likely to invest in learning uh, how to work with Instagram, knowing that it would be acquired by Facebook? Um, I don't know. In fact, I'm not sure how many people here know, but uh, before the acquisition, the market for photo sharing social networks was dominated by uh, uh, Hipstamatic and Instagram. So question number one, who had heard the word Hipstamatic before? If I run a poll, I doubt that more than five or 10% of people in here would. Andre uh, would certainly, but uh, I don't know about many other people. So, um, and I cannot stress this point enough. I don't think it's, uh, I'm not saying that adopters are not rational. So when I present an example of this, it's not that they're not rational. I believe that, you know, that's my job. I have to believe that people are rational. It's that the business model of incumbent firms and entrants is extremely difficult to understand and predict. And I've been repeating that in a variety of contexts. If you want to understand the uh, digital space, how it differs from uh, pharma, from cement, from uh, breakfast cereal, what have you, is precisely the extraordinary difficulty in predicting business models. Even the incumbents themselves have no idea what they're doing most of the time. They just encounter success as it comes. They, oh, yes, they may see that this may have some uh, be a potential competitor, but who knows? And so in practice, in terms of modeling, this leads to very diffuse forward reasoning. And, and in this sense, I think the digital space is very different from other spaces. And to be go technically to, to what uh, the paper does, I, I'm not an expert in global games, but uh, I'm very skeptical of applying global games in a situation when you know a priors and posteriors are so diffuse as they are in this context. Uh, this is precisely, in my opinion, the type of application where I wouldn't use global games as, as a uh, selection uh, <clears throat> criteria. And generally speaking, and related to that, uh, one problem that is related to the diffuse nature of this industry is the distinction between preemption and substitution, between substitutes and complements. Uh, the paper is focused on new platforms, 
uh, that having strong network effects will be a substitute for existing platforms. But in practice, this distinction is not at all obvious. I mean, in fact, I, mean I, I hate to go back to the Facebook example, but that's the one that everyone goes to. to. Um, yes, it could have been, a, you know, in some ways it's a substitute for Facebook, but it's also a compliment. In fact, it was clearly not a killer acquisition in the, in the uh, Florian et al. kind of sense. Uh, 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 we know that uh, um, Facebook did not kill it, and in fact, uh, has made a ton of money uh, off of it. Um, more generally, I believe the vast majority of the acquisitions in the digital space have more of a complementary than a substitution effect. Um, and also for that reason, I think the policy prescription of uh, forbidding mergers, it's very highly, uh, very highly controversial. And not just because of the exposed efficiency as Luigi mentioned, and rightly so, but because uh, it's so difficult to, dis to determine whether a certain acquisition is a substitute or a complement. I simply cannot see a practical way of short of the nuclear option from now until the rest of the world, Google and Facebook are hereby notified that they cannot make any acquisition other than the nuclear option. I, I find it very difficult to, uh, to, to have, uh, to implement that sort of policy. Now, um, the Universal Declaration of Discussion Rights clearly states in its Article 13 that a discussion has the right to include a shout out to his own or her own work. And so, um, uh, based on that article, I would like to mention that, you know, I've been also working on in this space, as it were, uh, and, and I believe that my paper standing on the shoulders of dwarves uh, deals, well, pretty much with the same problem, but in a different way. And uh, it's kind of interesting that in some ways, I would, it would agree uh, with uh, Luigi's paper that banning mergers may actually have a positive effect on radical innovation. So we do agree on that for different reasons, by the way. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's kind of an interesting uh, point of agreement. Uh, and I think it's a useful thing to think about. Uh, the question, of course, is the opportunity cost of that. And the opportunity cost is a huge, in my opinion, a huge uh, decline uh, in incentives for incremental innovation. And I don't have any empirical evidence, but I've been working on with the uh, a, a venture capital, I mean, uh, with a startup, um, a bunch of startups in, in, in this space. And I would say that, you know, one out of two, maybe two out of three, their business model is very clear. I want to be acquired. Innovation for buyout is a super important phenomenon. And so uh, we have to also understand the enormous opportunity to cost of a, a, a policy of forbidding acquisitions, uh, because this ecosystem is very different from other industries that they're more used to, uh, precisely because it's so difficult to protect and to transfer IP without just simply outright acquisitions. And so um, I, I know that this is not the core of, 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 paper, of, of Luigi's paper, but I think this uh, a policy of, of forbidding acquisitions is uh, uh, extremely problematic. Um, you Thank have you. to understand the uh, trade-off between yeah, uh, 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 radical and, and, and incremental innovation. And um, um, I could talk more about that, but I won't. Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> no, the I think I, I think uh, you're free. You, um, if we have time at the end, of course, we will talk more about this. I think this is an important point on the policy implication. We have just other couple of questions. The first one is from uh, Heski Bar Isaac. Well, well, in the, can yeah. Can I respond a second to, to Luis for, for one minute? Oh, yeah, sure. But if you want to get more questions, that's why I was uh, no, no, planning but, uh, to I, go ahead. I, otherwise, I forget. So okay. let, let's deal okay, with, with Luis. So first of all, thank you a, a lot for your comments. Um, I think they're very interesting. I um, Two things. One, uh, you are pointing out, I think correctly so, that uh, uh, the uh, complication of analyzing this space is uh, how complicated the consumer choice is and now depends on the forward uh, expectation of what happens. And uh, so I think that's exactly why Global Games is the way to go. Uh, now, you might disagree with our specific uh, um, assumption. I think that uh, 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 depends a lot on uh, uh, what you think. In a sense, uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, the Microsoft uh, application, uh, in the past, I think that uh, this is clearly a good assumption in my view, because there is a, there is a cost of moving uh, Excel from one environment to the other, and we saw that that was a relevant factor. 
Um, today uh, might be different, but today maybe the cost is in individuals. So I personally uh, don't want to learn. Uh, there was uh, during the, the two weekends ago after WhatsApp put uh, out a new privacy restriction, uh, a lot of people started to switch to Signal. And so I have a group of uh, um, old high school friends in Italy, and they, it uh, was a discussion about whether you move to Signal or not. And uh, we still are not converged. We're, we're kind of multi-homing and it's a nightmare because you don't know, now you have double cost of looking at the two things. And, and part of it is people do not want to learn a new interface. And so if you know that eventually Signal would be integrated with uh, with WhatsApp and there would be the same sort of uh, things, you don't wanna pay that cost. So I think that the idea that uh, switching costs can be reduced by a merger uh, are real. And the fact that the expectations imply, have implication for pricing are real. And once you put the two together, uh, maybe this is not the, the uh, certainly it's not the only model, maybe it's not the perfect model to capture this intuition, but I think that it is a model that captures those two intuitions that in my view, and it seems also in your view, are uh, crucial. On the sausage and complement, I cannot agree more with you. Uh, in a sense, we have a discussion in the paper, I didn't have time in the presentation, about how slippery the distinction between uh, uh, substitute and complement uh, is in this space. Uh, and, uh, uh, but even if uh, it is, uh, uh, and so I, I, I'm sympathetic to the application part, if you are a judge and you have to decide, it's very difficult to, to decide. Uh, but I think that uh, in reality, many applications have a little bit of both. So think about uh, uh, the acquisition uh, by Google of Maze, uh, which is an alternative way to, to do Google Map. And uh, is uh, um, Maze really challenging the search algorithm of, uh, of Google? Probably not. Uh, but uh, uh, is it complementing and make, making stronger the, the, the market uh, uh, control of Google by merging? Absolutely. So I think that uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky business. I agree. Okay, thank you very much. So I would like to just uh, raise the other uh, questions so that uh, we have uh, now open Q&A for the last five minutes. So Heski uh, Bar Isaac would like to ask uh, two questions. So the first one was about indeed to follow up question on Luis point saying that, you know, uh, what about subsidizing innovations and entry rather than uh, maybe a more uh, radical policy like banning mergers? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the more I present this paper, the more I think about this issue, the more I think that uh, clearly a policy of banning acquisition is, is not the way to go. Uh, so the question is, what is the best alternative? And, uh, and I think that uh, uh, to me, the best alternative in this space, in this, for this particular problem, but in general, is to increase the interoperability. Because uh, at the end of the day, uh, the reason why the decision of my friends and I to be on Signal or on uh, uh, WhatsApp is so complicated is because it's costly to be on both at the same time. And uh, very often, at least I, I don't know if uh, you who are more sophisticated, but I take the switching cost uh, as exogenous, something technological, et cetera, but they're not. And to me, it was very interesting. I, I listen and I strongly encourage all of you to listen. There is an episode of Planet Money, a podcast uh, dedicated to power ventures. Uh, this was a little uh, uh, startup in, in California uh, that uh, in the late 2008, 2009 was trying to uh, kind of uh, disintermediate social media by aggregating that. So if you wanted to post your picture contemporaneously on uh, uh, Instagram, Instamatic, uh, and uh, uh, Facebook, you had power venture that uh, would allow you to do that and would allow you to capture the messages from all this and see them in a interface of your choice. So that was the perfect uh, solution to interoperability. Now, uh, did uh, this didn't work? No, it worked perfectly from a technical point of view. Facebook sued the hell out of them and was able to establish in the court of law that if I give Luis my login 
and password for Facebook. And Luis logs in into my Facebook account with my permission. He commits a federal crime called hacking and he can go to jail. And the irony is that Facebook had done that for the better part of their early existence. But of course, like every firm, uh, they are pirate when they enter and they become conservative when they are established. It happens to people too. And, and I think that, uh, <laughs> uh, I think that uh, in that in doing so, I think that uh, they made interoperability very difficult. And I think that uh, interoperability is the way to go. Sorry for the long answer. Sorry, uh, we had Sorry. another question, sorry, from Stefan uh, about this interoperability point. Uh, he basically raised whether the long-term out long outcome would differ significantly with interoperability because there are also network effects playing a role. So would the, that solve the everything? You know, since uh, we have not worked out uh, across all the T's and dollars, my, my intuition is that uh, uh, once you have interoperability, then the major friction that drive this model that uh, you are concerned about how many customers are gonna get disappears. And so if you have a higher technology, all your customer, will, all the customer will switch to you almost instant instantaneously, increasing the return to technology. Now, of course, you're gonna say, oh, but uh, uh, incumbents are gonna put additional uh, friction are going to try to, but that's in a sense what we're trying to to fight. I think that uh, the, the 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 fight should be in trying to reduce this uh, entrenchment cost because this what uh, these switching costs are, rather than allow them uh, because they exacerbate the problem. So let me just say that very quickly. I do completely agree that the key is going to be uh, interoperability, switching costs, more generally behavioral regulation. I mean, I. And the, the uh, recent efforts uh, in European Commission, uh, but also in, in North America, I think going that direction, I think that's way more important than regulating uh, m and uh, And I, I'm glad that we agree on that because not everybody agrees on that, by the way. Um, there was a other question uh, from uh, Andre Haju, given that we are nearly uh, on you know, ending our uh, one hour slot. So I would like to just raise it uh, myself to make it quicker. So Andre was asking that, I think that point you already answered, uh, whether it's important that the, the, uh, the network effects are not something that the app developers care. I think you said that it's not very important for the main results, but, uh, but it just gives simplified uh, analysis. The second question is the quality of the entrant uh, they perceive is assumed to be wiped out by a merger. What if that quality persists, which is certainly the case with Instagram? Uh, you know, it's true that uh, Instagram continue as an independent uh, entity, uh, but not, uh, I, I should qualify, not really independent in the sense uh, uh, in the moment in which uh, in the, the famous weekend in which uh, Facebook uh, kicked out uh, Trump, for example, uh, a lot of uh, Trump supporters were questioning where to go. And uh, clearly they couldn't go to Instagram because they, they knew what would happen. So the fact that uh, the, even if the alternative exists, uh, the fact that is not pushed that hard, but most importantly does not have the independence of movement is really important in this expectation of switching. So I think that uh, uh, in the reason why uh, uh, Facebook could do that could kick out uh, uh, Trump so easily is because uh, at the end of the day, uh, many customers have nowhere to go. And, uh, and I think that uh, the example I gave of my friends, who are not, by the way, Trump supporter, but they want to switch uh, to a different platform, suggest how difficult that is. Okay, so given that it's 3 p.m., I, I keep receiving more questions. I think uh, there's more interest on this topic. So let me just uh, officially end the seminar here. And for those of you who have uh, raised questions on the chat, I already told you if you'd like to ask your questions yourself. So you can stay here with us and then we can have further discussion for a couple of more minutes. But I would like to just uh, tell everyone, thank you. And, uh, and the recording of the session at this point so that uh, we have the official part ended, but uh, we keep uh, discussing further.